to The Crossing. So glad you decided to join with us today. It's Memorial Day weekend, so special shout out to everyone that serves or has served in our military. On behalf of everyone here at The Crossing, thank you for your service. We're in a brand new series called House Beautiful. It's all about how to make our homes more beautiful spiritually. I can't wait to get into it. We'd love to talk with you anytime throughout service, so make sure to say hi in the chat. If you need prayer for anything or just want to talk in private, you can hit the live prayer button to start a private conversation with me or a member of our online team. If you want to take ownership of this service, then hit the give button at the top right of the screen. All right, now let's get into service.
on the clouds Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is the light The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him And our God is the Lamb For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates. Claim before the King of Kings The God who comes to save Is here to set the captives Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battle What's up, everybody? How you guys doing? I hope you're having a wonderful day. I am so excited to be here with you. To those of you joining here at 48th Street and those joining across all across the region, we're excited to have you. To those of you watching online, to those of you part of our .TV family, and of course, uh, the wonderful people that are part of the Crossing Inside. So thankful we have the opportunity to hang out and interact with one another today. I believe in my heart that today's going to be a great day. And if you're here for the very first time across all of our locations or joining us online for the first time, my 
hope and my prayer, and it's not just mine, it's the hope and prayer of all the people that are around you, is that God would use today, uh, whether through the sermon or the worship, to just draw you closer to him because uh, he's pursuing you. Well, before I jump into the message, there's a couple quick announcements that I, I want to make to make sure that we're all on the same page as we're getting ready to move forward. Uh, we look for opportunities to be hyper-evangelistic. We look for great uh, weekends where it's a home run for you to invite a friend uh, and bring him here. And on Father's Day weekend here at The Crossing, we are going to be hosting Daryl Strawberry, and he's actually going to be preaching on stage, yeah, which is a big deal. To those of you who don't know who Daryl Strawberry is, uh, throughout the 80s and 90s, Daryl Strawberry is one of the most feared hitters in Major League Baseball, appearing in the All-Star Game eight times and playing on four World Series championship teams. He is known for his tape measure home runs and intimidating presence at the home plate. He uh, was far from God for a really long time, turned his life completely around, and uh, he's actually going to be preaching and sharing his story that weekend. And so if you're looking for a great time to invite dad or your brother, that's the weekend. Now, he's also going to be hanging out and participating during men's conference, Uncommon 18. And if you have not signed up for that, that Friday, he's going to be here sharing. And so make sure you guys talk to your campus pastor or, uh, or sign up because we'd love to have you at that event because he's got another message that he's going to be sharing just for those of you who are part of Uncommon. Now, in association with that, you know that our church is always trying to find new ways to reach people. And a while back, right after Super Bowl weekend, we made the shift where we made Sunday the first service of the weekend and Thursday the last service of the weekend. Well, we've been paying attention to that, we've been watching it, we've been measuring it, and we actually feel like it is in the best interest of our church if we were to make the switch back to Thursdays being the first service of the weekend and Sunday being the last service of the weekend. Here's what this means, is on June 10th, that sermon is only gonna exist on that Sunday. So we're gonna be doing our normal stuff all the way up till Sunday, June 10th, and then that following Thursday, Daryl Strawberry will preach, and then we'll be using that message again on Sunday, and that's when we're gonna get back into the rotation. So if for some reason you're not gonna be able to be here on June 10th, make sure that you watch online. Now let me explain to you why we try stuff and then why we try other stuff. For those of you who are going, the crossing just changes for the sake of change. Or we're just schizophrenic in our leadership. Actually, the, there, some of that might be true. But uh, here's the real reason why we do this. One of our core values is we grow. We will never stop measuring, changing, and moving for growth because nothing matters more to God than people. And when you try new things, sometimes you'll be wrong. When you try new things, sometimes it won't work out the way you want. Sometimes you'll try new things and you might not get the fruit that you hoped. But I would much rather be a part of a church that is willing to try things to reach new people than not try anything at all. And so I appreciate your guys' grace as we try to navigate this stuff and create the best environment for people to bring their friends to church. That being said, I want to talk right or jump right in to this message. We're in this sermon series called House Beautiful, and it's all out of the Beatitudes found in Matthew 5, and it all, they all start off with blessed. Blessed is blank, blessed is blank. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you at all of our locations, you want a blessed life? Put your hands up. Yeah, who, no, nobody's like, no, I don't, I don't want that. Yeah, everybody wants a blessed life. And in fact, publishing companies know this because there are books galore about how to find a blessed life, get a blessed life, keep a blessed life. People are making millions telling you something that Jesus taught thousands of years ago on how to actually have a blessed life. The problem with what Jesus talks about is his blessings are conditional. And nobody likes conditional blessings. We want unconditional blessings. And some of you are like, well, Jesus is an unconditional God. In some areas, he's unconditional. He has unconditional love for you, but his blessings are conditional. And we don't like conditions. In fact, I'm going to kind of go into a part of our heart where we sometimes don't want to recognize. And the reason we don't like conditions is because on some level, we are all entitled. You drive up next to somebody at the stoplight and they drive a much nicer car than you. And you're like, 
I wish I had a doctor's money. But you didn't go to medical school and you didn't navigate crushing student loan debt. So you ran your course and they ran theirs. Some of you, you look at skinny people and you're like, oh my goodness, I wish I could have that rocking bod. And, and you're like, ah, oh, but I like food and I don't like to sweat. So you, <laughs> you get, okay, so there's, a, I gotta tell you this story. It's a funny joke and it's one of my favorite jokes for the last couple months. So a, a husband uh, and his wife, they've been married, you know, 20 plus years and he gets out of the shower one day and he's toweling off in the mirror and he's looking at himself and he's like, sweetheart, I just gotta be honest with you. I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm just old, ugly, fat, and out of shape. Can you just say something to cheer me up? And she said, well, sweetie, your eyesight's darn near perfect. <laughs> oh, man, I just keep telling my, I, I, it doesn't even fit. I just need to get that out so I can get a new joke. Maybe, maybe you want the marriage you see in another couple, but you don't want to take the time to devote yourself to them, and you don't want to learn their love languages. We want the blessings, but we don't necessarily want to live with the burdens or the boundaries associated with them. So I'm going to start this way, which is a way I never start my messages. I'm going to give you like my invitation first. I'm going to tell you what the blessing is. I'm going to tell you before, I'm going to actually let you see the after picture before you start the diet. What's the blessing? If you do the condition, what do you get? Here's what you get. Matthew chapter five, verse eight. Blessed are the, tell you in a minute, for they will see who? God. Blessed are the, for they will see God. How many of you would appreciate or enjoy a clear picture of God in your life? Yeah, just a better way to see him to be closer to him, to bring him into visibility. There, now, how would you like to see God moving in your family, uh, through the midst of your marriage? Maybe some of you are in the middle of pain right now, and a glimpse of God, a vision of God in your life would be a life rope, or a, li a lifeboat that you could just cling to because when you're in the middle of your storms, sometimes it's nice to have something to fix your eyes on and that thing that you could fix your eyes on would be a clearer picture of God. Blessed are the, for they will see God. Now there's two ways to view this uh, passage. In the present, which is what it would look like for you to start seeing him better today for you to have access to a clear picture of Jesus in your life right now. And I'm willing to wager that no matter who you are, a clear picture of Jesus would be beneficial to us all. But there's a second way to kind of interpret this, and that is in the future, in what is to come. This is what it says in Revelation. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Don't get tripped up over the forehead tat, which for those of you who are wanting to get a forehead tat and your mom said no, Throwing this out there, okay? <laughs> okay, that was not in the sermon. Okay, they will see his face. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, now we see a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face, that there will come a point in time where those people who possess this quality will actually not just have a clear picture of Jesus in their daily lives, they will have a clear picture of Jesus in their eternal life because they will be in heaven with him. And I know that there have been times, more times than I can count, where I have needed to see a clear picture of God in order for me to navigate the things that come my way as a part of being alive. And my hope is that as we go through this message, you be willing to make the adjustments so that you can actually possess this blessing in your life. So here's what happens. If you wanna see God, this is what you have to do. You have to have a certain kind of heart. I want you guys to show, I'm gonna show you guys right here what it says. It says, blessed are the, everybody say this, pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, full disclosure. When we were putting this sermon series together, the elders did not call a special meeting and go, who is the purest person we know who could preach this message? Okay, there wasn't like a staff survey and they go, Clayton is definitely one of the purest people I've ever met. We should have him speak to us all about how to be pure, okay? I gotta be honest with you. I got the assignment, I started working on it and uh, there was a lot of this that kind of worked me over 
So you need to hear me. I'm going to preach this message hard. But it's not I'm preaching this message hard because, like, I've got this figured out better than you. I'm preaching this message hard because when I was working on this message, it was hitting me hard. Because it made me realize that there's just a lot of things that I do and that maybe we do that just are clouding a picture of Jesus. And this, not only do we need a clear picture of Jesus, the world needs a clear picture of Jesus. And our lack of purity, our purity of heart, is actually causing a problem there. You guys ready? So here's the problem. The problem with pure hearts is that we don't have them. I know you like to think, oh, but he's got a good heart. Or, oh my goodness, she's got such a good heart, Clayton. Have you ever like noticed that like you liked somebody until uh, they started dating one of your kids? Like you were really cool with that person until they came over and like were holding it. Yeah, you don't have a pure heart anymore. You had one. And then you liked my girl. Now you're out, right? We don't, we don't have pure hearts. Listen to what it says right here. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. I hate to tell you, but if you thought you had a great heart, no, you don't. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah chapter 17. This one's even uh, a little harder. The heart is, say, say this word, deceitful above all things and beyond. Imagine going into the heart doctor and him saying, yeah, your heart's in bad shape and there's nothing we can do about it. That's literally what the great physician is saying about our hearts. It's evil, it's deceitful, and it is beyond cure. You and I, we do not possess pure hearts. The second problem is we don't value purity. We just don't. Ephesians 5.3. You ready for this? But among you, there must not even be a, everybody say this word, hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. And here's the problem with us. We want to know more about this word, hint, than we do about this word, purity. We will spend all of our time, well, what exactly is a hint? How much can I do before I'm hinting at impurity? Right? If I were to say at all of our locations, did you guys like the coffee today? No? Okay. Uh, well, that makes sense because at all of our locations, we put just a little bit of poop in all of the coffee. Listen to me, listen to me, just a hint of poop. <laughs> now, you're not thinking, well, how much is a hint? You're thinking poop. <laughs> the word we should focus on is purity, not hint. This is the classic, hey, how far can we go before we get married? Hint versus let's focus on Purity. Here, let me show you. When I say that purity is not something we value, purity is not as important as our entertainment. Because we will watch stuff that is not good. I was watching uh, two shows on Netflix before we moved down to Quincy. And uh, I love, full disclosure, I love uh, watching violent uh, you know, man's man's kill people movies. And uh, I found a great one. It was perfect, just the right amount of blood. And uh, literally like 55 minutes out of every episode was just good plot, punch people kind of stuff. And then, then there was five minutes of every show that like they had to just get a certain amount of sex in in every show. And it was... Uh, uh, it was, it, uh, it was detailed. <laughs> and uh, here's the deal. I would be uh, watching the show, and then, like, you don't see the sex scene coming. Now, I'd be down in my living room. I'm not hiding up in a closet somewhere with, like, a laptop. I I'm, I'm in my living room. I'm watching it after my young kids go to bed. I'm grown. And I'd be watching the show. And it's really good. It's really, really good, really, really good. Then, oh, my goodness. 
The problem is my wife and daughter only seem to walk into the living room during the oh my goodness parts. So when I try to explain to my wife, hey, literally it was all good, literally until you guys walked in. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, what do you think it did for my wife and my daughter to see me watching a show and every time they come in, it's that? I mean, we just totally glassed over the fact that I was just content watching a bunch of people get killed and like, that's okay. But like the sex stuff, so I just had to say, no, I can't watch it. And I would, I would love to tell you what it was so I could tell you not to watch it. But if I told you what it was, you'd be like, oh my goodness, Clayton watches that? And then I'd be like, yeah, I watched it. Do you watch it? It's like people getting mad at what you watch until you find it. But this was hard for me because I value entertainment more than I value purity. Uh, we value uh, purity more than, or we value money more than we value purity. You'll lie about your kid's age to get them into a movie for free, like six bucks is gonna hurt you. Or like you'll lie about their age at a buffet, just cough up the four bucks. They're not gonna eat that much, but we'll keep it. Or you'll say things like, hey, uh, I mean, we would like to uh, you know, live apart until we get married, we just don't have the money. I mean, we're definitely doing the pure thing. We just can't afford to like not live in the same house together because we're more concerned about the word hint than we are about the word purity. Uh, and we definitely, we definitely don't value purity as much as we value sexual desires. She's almost divorced, so if we date, we're cool. He's almost out of that bad relationship, so I mean, we can start our thing now. Why wait, we're already in love, Clayton. I mean, my wife isn't really taking care of my needs, so I just found somebody. We don't value purity more than we value our own sexual desires. So how do I make uh, purity a priority in my home? If we've established the fact that purity is a problem, how do we get it into our house? The first one is it starts with you. Especially if you're the man in the house, you must be the example, not the exception. All right, I'm going to tell on my dad, and it's going to hurt his reputation and help it at the same time. My dad, uh, when he is like a great uh, animal surgeon, he's incredible, okay? And uh, it's amazing how good he is, because if you take my dad's glasses off, he is like a white Stevie Wonder, okay? Like his sight is gone. Dad couldn't see an elephant three feet in front of him if he took his glasses off. And when I was a kid, we would watch all the James Bond movies. We were James Bond groupies. We loved watching James Bond. And as you know, James Bond is great at, you know, keeping us all alive and, and keeping the world safe, but he's also a bit of a womanizer. And there's always, a, you know, those scenes in every James Bond movie. And literally, I have never watched a James Bond movie with my dad when whatever act is coming up that is between a man and a woman, my dad would always take his glasses off. And then when the music changed and he knew it was no longer Arturo Sandoval, he would put his glasses back on. And I always saw that my dad was always protecting his purity. Now, my eyesight's 2015, but uh, that's, <laughs> uh, yeah. ah, sorry dad, I don't have glasses. Uh, but like, I always saw that, that my dad valued his purity. And like growing up, seeing that that was the kind of man that was raising me mattered to me. I was uh, watching Christmas Vacation with my boys. And I, I remember that movie being totally fine. But then uh, when that girl's getting out of the swimming pool and the thing's starting to like pan down and she's coming up in her low cut swimsuit, I'm like, oh my goodness, we should fast forward. And my youngest goes, hey dad, can we rewind that and watch that again? <laughs> I was like, you're four. Uh, and I was like, I can't even watch Christmas Vacation with my kids. We gotta figure out a way to value purity. The next part you have to do is you have to defend your purity. Proverbs chapter four says this, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. Pay attention to what you watch. Pay attention to what you say. Pay attention to what you do. Guard your heart. 
You would not let a, guys, you would, you are looking forward to the day someone tries to break into your house. You've taken your concealed carry class. You've convinced your wife to let you buy all kinds of guns. You've got a dog that barks really loud. You leave the door unlocked with like money in the door while it's shut. You are taking pictures and showing people all your entertainment systems because you are looking forward to that moment where someone tries to break the glass and you get to take on a dude naked because you're sleeping naked and then you're gonna try and be Jackie Chan or Jet Li in the middle of the night. But that's you. You can't wait for that fight. No, most of you are pretty smart. You're like, yeah, no one is coming into this house. You're doing everything to pr uh, protect it. But yet you will let impure stuff into your home all the time. It says guard it. And don't, if you're a husband, if you're, if you're a wife, if you're a mother, if you're a father, you're not just guarding your heart. You're guarding your kids' heart. Then you have to defer, you can't run, you can't be pure running your own play, you have to run his. Listen to what it says in Psalm uh, 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? Now, young man, uh, this also goes for young women, this goes for old men, uh, aging women. <laughs> Ain't no dummy. Keep his way pure, hear me, how do you do it? By living according to your word, you spend time in God's word and you do what it says. It will keep you on a pure path. Read God's word, do what it says, you will stay on the pure path. And then you're gonna have to depend on him. You're gonna have to depend on God. This is not something you can do on your own. You're gonna have to cry out to him. Psalm 119.10 says this, I seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Do you hear the prayer? God Keep me on the narrow path. God, keep me from doing stuff that would break your heart. God, keep me from doing stuff that would be impure. God, I need you to come through. Now, how do you parent for purity? If I'm gonna be a parent, how do I make sure that I raise kids that uh, purity is fostered and encouraged? First thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you parent their heart, not their actions. You might be going, that's pretty hard. Have you ever told your kid, you're like one of your sons to apologize to the other one? And they go over and they're like, I'm sorry, you're so, you know, that's your, if, if that, and you're like, yeah, that wasn't a real apology. You actually need to be sorry for what you did. Well, I'm sorry if you can't take a joke. Nope, you didn't do it. Do it again. I'm sorry. If, if I just accept that junk apology, I'm parenting their actions. I'm not parenting their heart. What you did was wrong. You hurt your brother. Help deal with the heart. You see, the Old Testament was all about actions and Jesus was all about our heart. In the Old Testament, it said, hey, don't commit adultery. You got a wife? Just sleep with her. Don't sleep with anybody else. And they're like, that's purity. Jesus says, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. It's a heart issue. Those of you trying to write yourself a permission slip going, well, I've never cheated on my wife. Right. If you wanna live by the Old Testament, home run, good for you. But Jesus is actually concerned about what's in here. And if you're having all sorts of lustful thoughts, you're looking at all kind of inappropriate things, you're committing adultery in your heart all the time. In the Old Testament, it said don't murder, which you guys are all like, I like that one because I've got an A plus. Hopefully there's not a whole lot. Well, maybe there are a bunch of murderers here, but hey, we're a church for everybody. So just be cool, all right? You're going, hey, I've never committed murder. Jesus says, if you hate somebody in your heart, you're a murderer in your heart. You guys thought that like Jesus made everything easier. No, Jesus said, I'm about to die on the cross. Let me tell you why I'm dying. It's not because you haven't physically killed somebody. It's because in your heart you have 50 times because you've hated people. First Samuel 16, seven tells us a little bit about God. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Some of you ladies, your body's a 10 and your heart's a one. Some of you guys, you've got six pack abs, but you've got a zero when it comes to the right heart. From the outward appearance, people think, oh, that person's on point. Look at how they serve. 
Look at all the wonderful things that they do. Because your outward appearance is on point, but your heart is far from him. Jesus said, don't clean the outside of the cup and leave the inside of the cup dirty. The inside of the cup is actually what you drink from. Now listen to this, Matthew 15, 19. Why do we guard our heart? For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, and false testimony and slander. Leave this here for just a second. Why do you guard your heart? Because what goes into your heart eventually comes out. I wasn't planning on blowing up my marriage with an affair. No, you just kept letting stuff get into your heart that shouldn't be there. And guess what happens? Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sex. It didn't start with you meeting up with them. It started in your heart, so guard it. When you see stuff in your kids, when you see Jesus in your kids, celebrate it. Man, I see Jesus in you when you. That's how you parent for purity. When you're watching what's happening in your kids' life, that's the fruit that you're gonna get, is all those bad things if you don't guard their heart. Here's the next one. I want you to have conversations about high purity standards in your home. And listen to me, conversations are better than expectations. The parent who says, this is how it is in this home and I'm not budging, might actually alienate their child instead of actually be in the picture to help direct things with their child. I think it's good to have conversations and come alongside of them. A couple years ago at this campus, and I think I did it during my plane landing, I shared what Jennifer and I did for our daughter, Kennedy. Um, she was uh, 12, 13, and we gave her a purity ring. And uh, my parents gave me a purity uh, ring that I wore as a necklace until uh, I got married on my wedding night. I took my purity off. I was a virgin when I got married, and I, I gave it to her. And uh, it was actually helpful because I made a commitment that I was going to wear that purity ring all the time, and it was on a necklace. And it's hard to do things with a girl when your uh, purity necklace is all over the place, right? And uh, it's, if you're going to have a purity ring and you, a girl puts it on her finger, it's hard to do stuff with a guy when you're staring at your purity ring. And uh, full disclosure, I was not a virgin when I got married uh, because I loved Jesus all the time. I... I was a virgin uh, when I got married, partly because I loved Jesus and partly because I was worried if I kissed a girl for more than like 10 seconds, she'd get pregnant. And I didn't know how to raise a kid. Like, I, I wanna be transparent, like don't think, oh, Clayton was super holy. No, I, I was just, I did not wanna have a kid until I had a wife. And so that was just, a, I was super nervous about that. So we sat Kennedy down and we told Kennedy, Kennedy, uh, do you wanna be a, a virgin when you get married? And she said, yeah. I'm like, well, awesome. So we want you to be a virgin when you get married. And I said, well, uh, how, how can we help you protect that? And we had a conversation. I said, here's what I'm willing to do. Let's just make it to high school. Make it till you graduate high school and you're, I will send you and your mom anywhere in the world you wanna go on vacation. And so Kennedy chose Israel. And a couple years ago, uh, we sent Kennedy to Israel. And, uh, and it was because she had committed to that. Well, uh, two weeks ago, I sat down with Kennedy and I said, hey, you know, you're in college now. You still want to do that? Because I think that'd be super big. She's like, yeah, I want to be a virgin when I get married. I'm like, awesome. And uh, I said, well, what do you want to do? And, uh, and we started talking. I said, well, how about this? When you get married, I'll pay for your honeymoon. And I go, I'm guaranteeing that I have more money than the fool that you're going to fall in love with, at least at this stage in his life. <laughs> so a honeymoon on my dime is going to be way better than a honeymoon on his dime. I got hate mail from somebody at this location uh, a couple years ago when I talked about that story with my daughter. They couldn't believe that I would do that. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because we don't value purity. Question, what price would you pay for the purity of your child? If you could, what would you? I would have sold my car to send my daughter on vacation. If I'm walking to work because I bought her a killer honeymoon, you'll know I'm pedaling that bike every day because I am so stinking happy of the gift that I gave her and the gift that I gave her marriage. We have got to value purity, so how do I get a pure heart? If you're here today and you want one, or you're going, Clayton, I, I don't have it. You can't get it on your own. You can't buy it, so it doesn't matter how rich you are. 
You can't earn it, so it doesn't matter how hard you're willing to work. You cannot get a pure heart on your own. And that is the power of the gospel message. Because what we could not do, he did. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he purchased for you a pure heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this. I will give you a, everybody say this word, new We're talking heart transplant, folks. He takes our old, impure heart and he gives us a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. There are some of you that are listening to this message right now and your blood's boiling, you're frustrated because you wanted us to talk about anything else. Hear me, if you're frustrated the message that was just spoke, chances are you have a heart of stone. If you're mad about this stance on purity being old fashioned, your heart might be calloused. And maybe the best thing we could do is say, God, I I don't have it, but you can give it. To those of you who you've made impure decisions in your past and you're like me and you're going, man, I, I really messed things up, you need to know just because you've messed things up, it does not disqualify you from a heart transplant and you can get one today. And to those of you that are still in a spot in your life where you can say, I have a pure heart, I want you to recommit yourself to guarding it and to serving God with it because I believe with my whole heart that those who have a pure heart will see God and there's nothing I want to see more than him. We're moving to a time of decision. None of us are perfect, far from it. Jesus doesn't call us to be perfect either because he knows how unattainable it is. What he calls us to is to try, to try and be something more, something greater, something closer to him. A lot of people can take this sermon and be legalistic about it. They'll make rules and then fail to follow them. Remember what Clayton said, this is a heart issue. That's what God cares about. So this week I wanna do something a little different. Purity is not something you can accomplish alone. So we're gonna spend these next few songs together. I want all of us to repeat this verse as a prayer to God, to allow God to hear your heart as you pray it to him. Say it as many times as you need to for it to sink in, for his word to do work on your heart. Let his word cleanse you to wash away the pain and suffering, the nastiness of this world, and allow him to touch your heart in a new way. Psalm 51:10. create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Let's say it again together now. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Keep repeating it over and over again and let God into your heart. Let him heal your wounds, cleanse your spirit, and give you the strength to be better yourself and grow closer to him. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me.
Calvary when Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all of
There was nothing more pure than the decision Jesus made to die on a cross for our sins. He loved us so much, he sacrificed himself. He took your place just for a chance at a relationship with you. That's what communion is all about. So together as one church, let's spend some time thanking him for his sacrifice and recognizing the purity of his decision. Thank you so much for joining with us today. If you haven't already, hit the give button at the top of the screen and start being a difference maker in our online community. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me by emailing joeyh at thecrossing.net. I'd love to answer any questions that you have. Once again, thanks for joining and I'll see you next week.